Thank you for joining us for our annual video series from the International Symposium on Human Identification. Today we're here with Steve Bush. We're very lucky to have him. Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and what you do? You bet, Laura. Thank you so much. First off, I'm humbled that you would ask me to come here and speak to you guys today. Very excited to, uh, to talk. And uh, I, I just finished up a 19-year career at the FBI, so I've worked there since uh, 2002. I just resigned in May, so I'm uh, freshly out of the federal government and uh, now in the tech world. So I, uh, most notably there at the FBI, right before I left, I was involved with the uh, Forensic Genetic Genealogy Unit. Or it's, it's simply, it's been uh, called different things now. I, I think the FBI is currently calling it Investigative Genealogy, although you know it's gone through several name transitions over the years. So I was one of the pioneers of that unit. I was what, the first full-time uh, FBI agent to work on. Uh, FGG investigations, and so I'm coming fresh off of that into the uh, tech space. Happy to be here at ISHI and uh, happy to talk to you. We are so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. I know you're giving a presentation about some common myths. Can you tell us a little bit about that? You bet. So um, I think there are, I mean, this is a new technique, right? This isn't something that's been around for very long. And you know, 2018 was kind of the genesis of this. The Golden State Killer case was the big case, the watershed case, if you will. That, uh, that everyone references as the beginning of FGG in law enforcement. Uh, I had the fortune of watching that case be solved. Uh, Steve Kramer, who's an attorney at the FBI, he and I were partners when I was still at the FBI. Uh, he led that team as a team just of six people. And I know you've talked to several of those six people. Some of them were here uh, this week. And it was, uh, it was a big deal. It was a huge deal in law enforcement. And you can imagine after that uh, case was solved, the phones at the FBI were ringing off the hook of uh, detectives, local detectives calling, saying, how can I solve my case? You know, how did you do it? How much does it cost? How long does it take? And so that spawned you know, this, uh, I don't know if you call it a revolution, but certainly it has been, it's, it's the next best thing in law enforcement. It's a game changer in terms of solving cases. And so it's been, uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of that and to see how it is, uh, has impacted people's lives uh, in, in a positive manner, in my opinion. Absolutely. Um, we've been talking about it for many years here at the symposium, and I think it's really interesting to see how it's grown and changed. And given your long history with the FBI, what's been most surprising to you? What have you observed as it's you know, evolved? I think in the beginning, my biggest surprise was the, the vocal minority who was opposed to it from the beginning. Um, and I think, I think generally speaking, people fear what they don't know and what they don't understand. And I can tell you, as the people that were doing it, we didn't know it and we didn't understand it either because it was brand new. We didn't understand. I didn't know what a SNP profile was five years ago. Most people had never even heard that term, nor would they know what to do with it if they had one. And so after the Golden State Killer case was solved, I expected the, the support would be more hey, wow, we're excited. We've got this new technique that puts, you know, nobody really likes serial killers, right? We like to put them in jail <laughs> right, where exactly. they belong. And so I thought people would be more supportive of it. But there were a, a lot of folks, and I'll call them the vocal minority, who were opposed to it, saying this is, this is government overreach. This is you know, things that the government shouldn't be involved in. And I didn't expect that. I expected that people would be uh, more supportive of that. And even some of those folks were inside of law enforcement. Um, but I think that as the truth starts to come out about what this technique is and what it's not, and it's transparent to the public what we're doing, I think that more and more people are going to start to support it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see that growing and growing as we move forward. In addition to Golden State Killer, are there other cases that you've observed where you know it had such, you know, again, like a surprising or remarkable potential that was yeah. illuminated what it can do? So I think it's important to understand um, kind of how that uh, folded out in the FBI. So post GSK, for the next 12 months, Steve Kramer and I got together. We had a small team of folks at the FBI, an analyst named Melissa, who's awesome, and a couple other people who I won't name. Um, and we just got together and said, hey, let's, let's solve more cases. We need to build data. We need to build metrics so we can really understand what this process is. And in the next 12 months, we solved an additional 12 cases. And it was a big deal. We kind of called those the initial 12 you know, the first 12 that we solved. And we learned a lot along the way about, you know, how much DNA do you need? How much, what, what is the quality and quantity of that DNA need to be? And what are particular cases that would be useful for this? Now, in that uh, initial 12, there was a case that I remembered, and this was, I, I thought, a very notable case. It hit a couple very interesting pieces of, uh, of this puzzle. And that was a case, we called it the Daryl and Johnson case. She was a, uh, a nine-year-old girl up in Nampa, mm -hmm. Idaho, who was just walking home from school one day. This was back in 1982 and she went missing. No one knew where she was. And it wasn't until a short time later that her body was found. And, you know, it was horrible. It was tragic. She had been uh, sexually assaulted. She was murdered. Her body was left in a river. 
And um, what was interesting about this case when they came to us is we learned that someone had already been convicted for this case, a, a man named Charles Fain who lived up in the area. Um, they put a circumstantial case together, the law enforcement folks back then, and they, uh, and they used a hair that was found. There were, there were actually a couple different hairs um, found on her body, one in her underwear, one in her sock. And they used those hairs to par partially as part of a circumstantial case to convict Charles Fain. And Charles Fain spent 18 years on death row for that case, for a crime that he did not commit. And he was released, I think, in, in the late 90s, 99, I believe it was, is when he was let go because mitochondrial DNA was able to exonerate him. They finally took one of the hairs, because back in 1982, they didn't have mito DNA. They didn't code, there was no CODIS. There were, there were no STRs. None of that stuff existed for comparison. And so they took the same hair that initially convicted him, and then, it, and then they used that hair to exonerate him with mitochondrial DNA because the mito didn't match for him. But the case remained unsolved. And, and so I think there were a lot of folks that still suspected it could have been him somehow and there was some type of a mess. When those detectives, there was a, a detective up there, I won't say her name because I haven't gotten her permission to say it, but she wouldn't let that case die. And she came to us and said, can you help us? All we have is this hair. It was the hair that convicted the wrong guy. It was the hair that exonerated the wrong guy. Can you use this hair in order to do this magic genealogy thing that you guys did on Golden State Killer? Now, at that time, there was no uh, US DOJ policy in place for STRs being a, a, a requirement, because obviously there's not, you're not gonna get an STR from a hair. And uh, we talked to the prosecutors about it ahead of time and said, hey, look, um, this could be difficult because you have to do, you have to have a, a comparison of crime scene DNA to suspect DNA that has to match at the end of this process in order for it to work. And they said, we want to do it. We want to make it work. And so we went, uh, we went to a lab at UC Santa Cruz, Dr. Ed Green, who's here uh, uh, presenting. Ed's a great guy. And Ed was able to get an autosomal profile from that hair. And from that profile, we conducted forensic genealogy and we identified the killer of Daryl and Johnson, a guy named David Dalrymple. Now, this won't come as a surprise to you, but Mr. Dalrymple was already in prison. He was in prison for lewd and lascivious acts with a child under the age of 14. So fortunately, he wasn't out in society harming anybody else, at least not as of present. You know, but our hope is that this you know, newfound conviction will put him in jail for a little bit longer. And I just thought that was an interesting case because it hit on so many different things. It wasn't just a typical case. It was a cold case where a, a, a wrong person was convicted, and FGG in this case was able to help exonerate the innocent and convict the guilty. To, to, uh, to enlighten the truth, really a cool, a cool story. I think that's a remarkable illustration of how everything is coming together and people are working together to achieve justice in ways that weren't possible before. So that's you right. can look at those cold cases and solve them now. And such a cool team effort too, because there were so many things that had to go right in all of these cases, especially the cold cases. And it, and it started back in this case with whoever the first detective was that arrived on scene and preserving that evidence and making sure that it's logged correctly and that it's in the correct spot in the evidence locker and that they hang on to it and they keep track of where it is. And you know, it's like there are so many investigators that worked on it along the way. And then, you know, to kind of, it's almost like in, a foot, in football, right? They get the ball all the way to the one yard line and then you hand it to me and I get to score the touchdown and I feel like I'm the cool guy. But really, it was all of these other folks that pushed it all the way down, all of those different teams from so many different agencies um, to come to a solution like that really is, uh, really is exciting. And I think that team effort makes the story so compelling. And yeah. I think that's why everyone is so interested in the work that's being done. Now, I understand you worked on the curriculum. How do you take all these learnings that you've had as you've you know, sort of seen this grow and then put that into something that others can you know, learn from, have some metrics, understand how to do it properly with best practices? It's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. <laughs> um, the, the FBI is a bureaucracy. It's in its name. Um, and any big government, I mean, any big company for that matter, when you're going to try to do something new, um, I think they're hesitant to change. And so for the FBI, it took a while for them to adopt um, what that was going to look like. And part of the, the precursor to the, uh, to the curriculum that we wrote was we had to get some approval at a higher level from the FBI. And so after we did those first 12 cases, uh, myself, Steve Kramer, a couple other folks went back to headquarters and presented all of this to the deputy director and said, hey, this is what we've done. You know, here are some facts about a dozen cases, how much it costs, how long it takes, the legal implications, if we, if we think there are any, and kind of how we think that you know, this lane should be drawn. And he said something to me, Laura, that I'll never forget. At the conclusion of this big presentation with a bunch of guys in suits who I don't know, he looked us right in the eyes and he said, gentlemen, this is the Lord's work. 
and the FBI should own this. And to me, as a, as a Christian guy, that meant a lot to me. And I was like, wow, this, it's a big deal. This is a big deal. It really is a, a game changer. And he wanted that to move forward. Part of his pledge was, I need you guys to establish a national program within the FBI. I need you guys to build a curriculum to train additional FBI personnel to do that. So when I, I had done a lot of teaching in my previous uh, roles at the FBI, I was a, a SWAT team leader at the FBI. And so I taught firearms and sniper operations and stuff like that. I built a lot of curriculum for that part of my job and so I had a foundation to build on but I'm not a science guy I mean I was an engineer by training but I'm not a DNA guy I was not a biology major and so the good news is most of genealogy you don't really need to understand some of that you need to understand the practical application of it but you don't necessarily have to understand all of it and so that made it a little bit tough um, but we've assembled a team of motivated people and we worked hard and we put together a curriculum that I think is a uh, is, is good and I think it's helpful. I think it adds value to the investigators who did it. We started that curriculum back in March of uh, 2020. Actually, it was right as COVID was kicking off, which was a crusher, right? Because you do this 40 hour in-person training and literally when that training ended, they said, hey, COVID, everything's done. And so at that point it was tough. Um, virtually delivering it in the following years was not easy. So it's, it's tough. Yeah, absolutely. Last year was crushing in so many ways. Um, how did you navigate that? You know, what challenges did you face? I mean, I'm sure you faced challenges introducing a new curriculum anyway, but what was that like over the next year? I mean, it's, it's hard enough to explain something to somebody in person. And I mean, you could, you see this with your kids, right? I have four young kids at home when, and you're trying to explain math over a zoom. It's like, it just doesn't make sense to them. And so here you're taking a concept that a lot of these agents don't understand and haven't done before. And so that was just hard. You know, we tried, we tried a lot of the, the, uh, virtual curriculum. Um, thoughts. It just it made it difficult, and um, I think that there was there was a hit in the quality of what was coming out of those trainings because of it. But that's just par for the course. I mean, there's not there's not uh, any other way to do it better until you can get back in person uh, with people. Absolutely. Well, and I know as part of your talk, you're going to bust a few myths that are out there about that's forensic right. genetic genealogy. Can you share a couple with you us? You bet. I think uh, I think probably the biggest myth that I hear, and this is from people in the public is that the FBI is looking at your private genetic code. They say, well, this is my private genetic code, which I would agree it is, and the FBI shouldn't be looking at it. And what's, what's interesting, and we'll just blow the myth out, we don't look at it. <laughs> so the only person whose private genetic code we actually see is that of the bad guy. And I would make the argument that when you, you leave your DNA inside a person that you raped or murdered, that you've given up your right to privacy with what we can do with that DNA. I think there's settled case law for for that, and so that's what the FBI would do, is we would get a SNP, right, a SNP profile of the bad guy's DNA, which has his genetic code, which you know, if you've ever looked at it, it'd be like me showing you the back end code to Facebook or Google, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros, right, it's a bunch of A's, T's, C's, and G's. I don't know what it means, even if I did see it. Um, but once we upload that to these databases, like Family Tree DNA or GEDmatch, and we get results back, those results don't show us the private genetic code of the innocent third parties that have put their stuff in. It simply shows us a percentage of DNA, an amount of DNA that you have in common. And, uh, and remi remind you, those folks are people who have voluntarily uploaded their DNA, and they voluntarily checked a box that says, I would like law enforcement to be able to use my DNA to help solve crimes. And so I see it as, as a good win-win. It's very different than CODIS, right? CODIS is DNA that's not taken uh, with consent. It's taken against your will, and it's also housed by the government. And I'm a, I'm a supporter of CODIS, don't get me wrong, but congressionally mandated, it's a whole different deal. This is voluntary, informed consent from people doing it, and we're not looking at their private genetic code. So I would say that's, that's probably the biggest one. And the second one that I would say a lot of people don't realize is law enforcement, specifically the FBI, we don't have some type of special access to these databases. We're not, we don't have some superhuman cute computer code that's doing some stuff, you know, black box behind the scenes type stuff. What we see when we upload a suspect's DNA is exactly what you see when you upload your DNA. It's exactly what the public looks at. And so we look at the, the same thing. We just draw conclusions based on, on what we see there. Um, and it's, there isn't some secret behind the scenes, you know, computer program that allows us to hack into ancestry or something like that. It just doesn't work that way. I think that's a good clarification for people who are reading a lot of the media coverage of what's going on and really don't understand sort of the nuance behind it and what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah. What do you think the future holds? I mean, this really is the beginning. It's a little bit nascent. Yeah. 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 I think the future's bright for FGG. I think we are at the tip of the iceberg. I think that, um, 
If law, if law enforcement continues to be transparent about what they're doing, if they continue to do the right thing the right way is the way that I would say it, um, then I think genealogy is going to be okay. I know there are some states that have come out with some laws that have limited what we do. I would say that there's, um, there's some ignorance in the support of those laws. I think once you see, I mean, you're talking to the person who I, I was just, I was blessed to be in a spot that I could do this. This wasn't because I was some awesome investigator. It was just the Lord lined it up for me to be in that spot and that's how it was. And I got to see things that other people didn't get to see. And I can tell you that a lot of the, con the misconceptions that are out there are driving decisions, but those decisions aren't based on facts. And truth, truth has to be the arbiter of that disagreement. Like they have to enlighten what's actually going on what law enforcement officers are actually doing. And once they do that, then they can make educated decisions. I think an interesting point to bring up, um, one of the pieces that we use as part of this process is a, <clears throat> is a thing that we call voluntary reference testing. Okay? And maybe you've heard some people call it target testing. Um, what this is, is this is where we're in the process of building family trees. We're trying to reverse engineer who our bad guy is. And we get to a spot on the tree where we say, you know what, I'm not really sure where it goes. It's either going to go this way or it's going to go this way. But if I could talk to one of these 20 people that are here in this spot and get them to voluntarily give me their DNA, I can trim this entire half of the tree off and I can focus over here where we know our suspect is. So one of the things we did at the FBI was we wrote a guide, a standard operating procedure for how do you conduct these reference tests. Number one on that guide is be truthful, okay? You gotta, you're not gonna go in and hide the ball with these folks. You go in and you be truthful with them. And I would do this all the time. I've done it probably more than any FBI agent yet. Although now that I'm out, there's somebody else will surpass me and break the record, I'm sure. But you know, you go out and you knock on their door and you just, you just tell them the truth. Hi, I'm with the FBI. I'm here to solve a horrible crime and whatever publicly available details I can pass on to them, I pass to them. Here's what happened. Here's the, here's the female you know, whose, whose life was taken away from her, you know, whose livelihood was taken away from her. And we're trying to solve this and we don't know who did it. And your information, your genetic information is gonna be enough to help us figure out who this person is. Do you know how many times I was refused DNA in those voluntary situations? Are you going to say zero? I'm was say it zero. zero? Wow. I'm going to say zero. And what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that the public is supportive of this when they know the truth, when they understand the facts. Okay, if you go there and you lie to them and you say, oh, I'm here to, I'm looking for an unidentified human remains, when in reality you're trying to, you know, do something else, that's not cool. That's not, that, that's not what law enforcement should be doing, in my opinion. And there's no need to, because you don't have to interview that one particular person. You could interview anybody in this little area, and it's going to give you basically the same thing. So... Um, I just think that that's something that's worth, worth pointing out, that I think once the public sees what it really is, they're supportive of it. That's been my experience. I think people do want to help, and when you put a face on it and a story behind it, yeah. it's, it's all the more compelling. Like, what can I do to make that a little bit better? Agreed, yeah. because they see the personal nature of what it is. Yeah. So talking about the myths and how you're busting some of those, are there any cases that illustrate what you're talking about that might help people better understand? You know, I think that the... Uh, Genealogy, forensic genetic genealogy, has been mislabeled a lot of ways as a cold case technique. I know a lot of people, when I was at the Bureau still, they'd say, oh, hey, you're the cold case guys, right? It's like, well, okay, I, I get it. I understand. We have cut our teeth on a lot of cold cases, um, and that's great. You know, it's been, it's been a, a way that we can really forge what this process is going to look like and help refine it and make it better. But I think it's important for people to understand that it's not a cold case technique. It's an identity resolution technique. Okay, and that identity resolution technique is a tool that's in your toolbox to help solve crimes, um, violent crimes. And so we had a case recently, it's not, it's not adjudicated and it's not done yet, so I won't give you the specifics, but it's a case where uh, there was a man who was at making active threats against a woman and her daughter. And those active threats, you know, they started with, with written letters and they escalated to phone calls. Um, and it got to the point where, you know, we as law enforcement were concerned that this person was actually going to act on these threats. And they were horrible, the things that he had written to this, uh, to this woman and her young child and, and the things that he called on the phone and said he was planning to do. They were terrorized beyond uh, belief. We were able to use genealogy to actually thwart anything happening to, to them. And we were able to figure out who this person was before he did something. Now, it brings up an interesting point because in the beginning, of the of the FGG world, there were a lot of people that said homicide and sexual assault is all that this should be used for. Period. Um, and you know, Jed Match got in some hot water back in in, in the 2019, right? When they had they allowed a law enforcement agency to use their services for something that was not a homicide and it was not a sexual assault. It was a woman who was beaten to within inches of her life. She didn't die. She wasn't sexually assaulted. 
but people saw that as a as a violation of their of their uh, terms of service the way that they put it forward now um, this case that I just described you would, would have fallen in that same category and so fortunately when DOJ came out with their interim policy which was that issue by the way at uh, in Palm Springs in 2019 I remember that yeah I was there when uh, when they presented that fortunately they left a carve out for that and they said it's no longer just homicide and sexual assault we allow for ongoing threats to public safety and ongoing threats to national security and so those two little carve outs in the policy give us a little bit of wiggle room <clears throat> with cases like this, cases that might not have been the standard homicide sexual assault case. Now, I used to tell people, I used to use what I called the, uh, the pressure cooker example. Okay, the, you remember the Boston bombings and how horrible that was and the, the improvised explosive device that those folks used. Well, in the beginning when there were those that said homicide and sexual assault is all that genealogy should be used for, I said, well, what about the pressure cooker example? What about the IED that's at the major sporting event in the major city? It doesn't go off. It doesn't kill anybody. It doesn't sexually assault anybody. And the suspect's DNA is all over that. Like, like the FBI, who's the lead counterterrorism agency in the world, we shouldn't use every means necessary, including interrogating the suspect's DNA from that device in order to figure out who he is. And it sounds asinine at face value, but there were some people that said, well, I'm not sure if we should do that. Well, I think we absolutely should do that, right? We're, we're preventing future lo loss of life. And fortunately, uh, the DOJ policy, when it came out, it left, a, uh, it left an avenue and a pathway for, for us to be able to do that in the future. That's a great example, and I think making that distinction for human identification versus cold case, which is what we've all read so much about in the right. news. Yeah. Well, you said you left the FBI in May, so I understand you've been working on something new in Dago. Can you tell us about that? I, I will. I will tell you. I'm excited about it. I've staked my livelihood on it. So I, <laughs> um, it, yeah, when I left the FBI, I did not retire. I resigned. There's a big difference in terms of your paycheck. Um, when you retire, you get a paycheck. When you resign, you don't. So that's the, the big one. Um, but what, what I noticed, and, and anyone who's worked any of these cases is going to tell you they came to this conclusion at some point, um, genealogy is hard. It takes a long time. It's a grind. Uh, you're up at night. You're on your laptop at 2 in the morning, and your wife wonders why you're on the laptop at 2 in the morning. You tell her you're doing genealogy, she doesn't believe you. <laughs> you tell her you're talking to Steve Kramer from the legal unit, she says, like the State Farm commercial, he sounds hideous, right? Because he does sound hideous on the phone. Just kidding. But uh, um, it's, it's hard. It takes forever. And so these cases, um, there, there's no software that's out there that helps investigators who are doing these cases. And there are specific pain points along these, um, the, the, this casework that is ripe for automation. It's ripe for a computer to come in and do things that a human doesn't do well. Um, I've got a nine-year-old daughter, and every once in a while we play that memory game. You know that game, right, where you flip over the cards, and 20 cards, 30 cards, I can hang, right? 50,000 cards? It gets, it's almost impossible. Like a human could eventually solve that problem, but it's a really, really hard problem to solve. And that's where um, anyone who's done this has realized, and I've been asked this many times, when is someone gonna come out with a software program that helps? And so we're, gonna, we're trying to do that. Um, I mean, I just resigned a couple of months ago, so we're in our infancy stages. We don't have, a, uh, we don't have anything to sell yet. We're just uh, in, our, in our building stage, and we're, we've got high hopes, and I, idealistically, Lord willing, we will, we will make something happen. Maybe next year we'll be talking about what we've done at our place, and hopefully we've got uh, some case solutions under our belt at that point. We would definitely love to hear more about that. And without giving away any of your proprietary information, yeah. are there certain pain points it's going to address that you can or, or want to talk about? I mean, I think the general pain point that people understand is just the volume of information that you have to deal with. Because when you get, um, you, you take a snip of, of a suspect and you upload it to GEDmatch and you look at your results, I mean, you don't just get five matches or 10 matches or 100 matches. You get 1,000 matches or 1,500 matches. I think 3,000 is the limit that they have now of what they look at. No human being can possibly go through 3,000 matches and determine which ones are relevant and which ones aren't relevant. Some people tend to say, well, the highest Centimorgan match is the best match. But I can tell you from experience that that's not true. And anyone who's worked these cases will tell you that, that, that that's not true because you may have a really high match, but you can't figure out who they are. You know, you share 900 Centimorgans with Fuzzy Bunny at gmail.com. Well, I don't know who that is, right? And I'm not ever going to be able to figure out who that is. And if I can't determine that, that match is useless to me. When in reality, you know, 10, 15, 20 matches down, there might be two or three lower matches that will make the case solvable. But it's tough to know that up front. So, I mean, that's a, just one specific pain point that I think uh, Indago is going to be going to be very, very helpful with uh, with investigators that are trying to do this efficiently.
I think automating that is going to be very attractive to a lot of people. And we usually ask, what's next for you? But it sounds like that might be what's next. Well, what's next is I'm going to get on a plane, I'm going to fly home to my beautiful wife and kids, and I'm going to write more lines of code, is what's, is what's next. Um, that's, uh, that's what we need right now, and so it's a little bit of a grind uh, for us. But I think that in order to change the game with genealogy, that's what has to happen. And, and you, can, you go to CODIS and look at the numbers. CODIS is great. CODIS has aided in you know, 500,000 investigations, plus or minus, up until this point. It's been a huge tool to help law enforcement solve. But one thing that's not addressed is what happens when you go to CODIS and CODIS says, I don't know who that is. And we've had several cases like that, serial cases. I mean, Golden State Killer was certainly one of those. But serial rape cases, where the guy rapes. He goes to CODIS, there's no hit. He rapes again, he goes to CODIS, there's no hit. How long does that have to happen until eventually we figure out who this person is? Well, if, if software like Indago is available, then you get to rape one time and then we figure out who you are because it's not going to take us months and months and months to determine it through uh, genealogy. We're hoping that we can do it uh, more quickly than that. Well, I really look forward to hearing more about that, absolutely. And I know for a fact you have been at Ishii before, but since you were with the FBI, we really never get to ask you about that or interview you, so we'll take this opportunity. How have you found Ishii over the years? How, how many times have you attended? What have you thought? Well, there's one thing's for sure. I'm definitely the dumbest guy here, I can tell you that. You walk around this place, there's some very, very smart people, some very accomplished people um, who are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to work together. And it's, it really is a team environment because there's so many people that might, they might be really good at one piece of this puzzle and they don't understand the other piece. And this person's really good at this piece and they don't understand their piece. And this is a forum that allows all of them to talk to each other. I've already had several sidebar conversations with people, which is really where you can make connections and figure out who's doing what. So it's a, it's a fantastic um, event that Promega puts on. We're excited to be here. I hope you guys continue to do it. I hope that next year the, the restrictions are a little bit less, right, so we can get more people in person, I think, would always be better. So, uh, but you guys have done a fantastic job, and we're, uh, we're honored to be here, so thank you. We are so happy to have you. Thank you so much for presenting this year. Um, it's wonderful to be in person at least half and half with our hybrid year this year, half here, half remote, whatever we can do to bring people together. <laughs> awesome, well thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Steve, yep. have a great rest of your conference. All righty, take care.